We're doing this sermon series, it's called Beloved Stand Firm. We're reminding everyone that you are very loved by God. You really, really, really are. You may be hated by the world. You may even be hated by your family members, but you are deeply loved by God. And God has equipped you, he's given you all the resources that you need to stand firm, to ground yourself, to root yourself as a Christian, And we're doing various studies through this epistle. And today we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter four, verses two to nine. You know, learning to debate and argue with people well is a skill set that will both enable you to present truth more clearly, but it will also guard and protect your relationships on some level. Being able to think clearly, to speak clearly, to be a rational, reasonable person is super helpful. Maybe you've studied logical fallacies. Maybe in school you remember that, where you were taught how to debate and argue. And you were told, these are things you you can't do and these are things you should do if you're gonna make a case or build an argument. So some common logical fallacies include ad hominem, This is when in an argument, instead of dealing with the argument, you just attack the person. Can't do that. That's not helpful. Or you argue from authority. You say, well, this person has the degrees or they're in a position of authority, so they must be right. Instead of actually assessing and analyzing the argument, you just appeal to the authority of the person. That's also a logical fallacy. Or then there's the effective fallacy, which is basically, well, I feel that this must be true, so it must be true. That's a logical fallacy. A straw man is when you misrepresent another person's argument. The middle ground fallacy is when you say, well, this is your view, and this is my view, so the truth must necessarily be right in the middle. That's the middle ground fallacy. So when you're studying logic and argumentation and debate, these, an awareness of these logical fallacies will help you to communicate more effectively and more clearly. However, a biblical worldview, while it does place a premium on the mind, the ability to think clearly, to communicate clearly, approaches reasonableness or rationality from a slightly different perspective. You see, a person can master logic, memorize facts, have a very high IQ, avoid all the logical fallacies and still be an atheist. And so it's not enough just to master Western logic to be a thoughtful Christian. It's not enough to go to school and learn as much as you can, just pack your mind full of information in order to be a rational Christian. Rather, we are called to love God with our minds. And in Philippians chapter four, there are three things that we are presented with which help us to love God with our minds. One of them is to be like-minded as a community of faith, One of them is to be clear-minded, and the third is to be holy-minded. So I'd like to dissect the passage with you along those lines. I think this is a super important message, especially in a world where there's so much confusion, evil-mindedness. We live in an emotionally driven world where many people make their decisions based upon fear or pleasure. So we we want to work hard at being reasonable people. And if we are reasonable, the more reasonable we are as defined by God's word, the better equipped we are to stand firm in our faith when we're presented with lies or chaos. So let's enter into Philippians chapter four, verses two to nine. And we're going to be called here to show our reasonableness, kind of biblical rationality, if you will, in the way we handle disputes, in our emotional responses to life, and in our thought life. So here's the first one, as I've already mentioned. We are called by God to be like-minded. Did you know that sometimes Christians don't always get along? Sometimes there are disputes and arguments among people that actually love Jesus. 
Well, this was the case in the Philippian church and Paul has to address it. He addresses it in a letter. By the way, it is kind of noteworthy that this particular dispute between two sisters, two women in the church has been recorded in the word of God for all times for us to study and to consider. Kind of embarrassing in some respects to the women who were part of it. Maybe when we meet them in heaven, we'll be like, we, we know who you are. <laughs> you were the ones that had to be called up by Paul for arguing. You were part of the church at Philippi. Here's what it says. He says, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. So these are two feminine names. They're two women in the church. He goes on to say, yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel. So think about that. These are mature believers. These are people that had actually served with the apostle Paul in ministry in the gospel together with Clement, another brother in the church, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So here we have an argument, a conflict that serves as sort of a case study for any conflicts or arguments that we might have as Christian people. Twice we see Paul saying, I entreat, I entreat one, I entreat the other. This double pleading that Paul issues to these early Christian believers doesn't specify the nature of the problem. We don't know what their dispute was. Maybe they disagreed on how the nursery should have been run. I don't know. Maybe they disagreed on the style of music that should have been sang in the church. I don't know. Maybe they were arguing about the appropriate length of skirts or dresses. I don't know what the argument was, but we know it wasn't doctrinal because if it had been doctrinal, they would have been disciplined by the elders of their church, Matthew 18. But it was some sort of a relational dispute. Again, not a, not a doctrinal dispute, not a moral dispute per se, but some sort of a relational dispute that evidently had been going on long enough that word had gotten to Paul that it was happening probably over the course of several months. They didn't have emails back then. So somehow from Philippi, Philippi to the prison Paul was in, he had received word that they were fighting and they were still fighting while his letter was being brought back. So this was an ongoing, probably multi-month long dispute between these two Christian sisters that became very public. And what does he call them to? He, he, he asks them, to set aside their personal differences, look at his language, in the Lord, in the Lord. So he's reminding them of where their true unity is found. You understand where our true unity is found? It's found in the Lord. By nature, we may not always get along, folks. You may consider another person to be too passive, too aggressive, too humorous, not humorous enough overly sensitive, insensitive. You may have come from a different cultural background. There's bound to be disputes and conflict among God's people. Even in churches like ours, it has happened. For all, for all I know, it may be happening right now. And if not, it will happen in the future unless Jesus comes back. There's always gonna be things for us to butt heads over. Paul calls them to unity in the Lord. His tone is not harsh rebuke. He's not like, okay, you know what? You're sinning, you're sinning, smarten up, or we're gonna call the elders of the church to discipline you. Rather, he, he just pleads with them like a pastor would. Folks, can we please get along? <laughs> can we please set aside all our petty differences and find our fellowship and our unity in the Lord. These women obviously had a significant role to play in the cause of the gospel, as he calls it, along with men like Clement. These were people that were clearly Christians. There was no question about it. Because Paul says, these are people whose names are written in the book of life. Do you know what the book of life is? It is a heavenly register within which God records the names 
of all Christians who have died, all believers that have died, and all believers that are currently alive who truly know the Lord Jesus Christ. Multiple scriptures speak of the book of life. The book of life is mentioned in Psalm 69, in Isaiah chapter 4, in Revelation 3, Revelation 17, Revelation 20, Revelation 21, Revelation 22. Multiple times, this heavenly register that God possesses, who was the names of all true believers recorded in it, past and present, is mentioned in the word of God. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your name is already written in the book of life. This reminder to these two Christian women also helped to remind them of their true identity, what really matters, what really matters. Now, sometimes when Christians conflict, other people have to intervene. <clears throat> when the church was smaller, I used to do a lot of intervening. I always seemed to be the, the sharp point of the spear, so to speak, when church discipline or conflict took place. Fortunately, as the church has grown, other people have saddled that burden. And it is a burden. Sometimes you have to intervene between disputes, between God's people. Paul here calls upon an unnamed individual, simply called a, a true companion. He doesn't name this person. He just says, I ask you also true companion. By the way, some people, the, the word here is Syzergius, and some people think that's, a, that's actually a, a, a proper name, even though it's an adjective, so it's un unlikely. But some people suggest that this is a, a name of a person whose name meant true companion. That was the meaning of his name. And the translator wasn't sure whether it was a, a proper name or just referring to the, uh, someone who was close to Paul. So we just have in the ESV here the word true companion, true, true companion, but regardless whether it was a, an unnamed person who was asked to intervene or a person whose name meant companion, either way, sometimes intervention and conflicts is necessary. This is why we practice biblical counseling in our church. This is why we want you in a small group. This is why we want you under the watchful care of a life group leader, a flock elder, this is why we want you to be connected to the life of the church, not just drifting in, enjoying the service and drifting out. We want you to be connected so that if you have a dispute or an argument in your marriage, or you're having a dispute with your child or your parent or another Christian, you are in a network of relationships where other people can step in and they can say, look, clearly you've lost objectivity here. Clearly, this has been going on for several months. We want to help you. We want to remind you of your unity in Christ. By the way, let's all be humble enough to acknowledge the need that we may have at times for intervention. Let's not just like hide and protect and put on a show and put on a face and pretend that uh, we can figure it out ourselves. Oftentimes, we can figure it out ourselves, but sometimes we need other people to intervene. And that's one of the beautiful things. It's not a bad thing. It's one of the beautiful things about being part of the Christian church. These particular women had a history of <clears throat> gospel ministry. And as such, we're reminded here that even seasoned Christians can clash. Even seasoned Christians can clash. Sometimes we hear of churches where elders are clashing. Seasoned veteran Christian brothers that are clashing and there's a need for intervention. But again, true reconciliation is possible in the Lord. So what does that mean in the Lord? Well, it means that Christ is the foundation of our fellowship. And when we drift into conflict, it means that we're either not reading the word of God and grounding our fellowship on Christ or we don't have the mind of Christ, the eternal mind of Christ. We're thinking about inconsequential things. Most of our disputes are about relatively inconsequential things. 
or we're not serving the purposes of Christ sufficiently, we, we're, we're, we're pursuing our, our own agenda, or we're not submitting to one another, as the scriptures call us to, for the common good of the Christian church. We need to work hard at this, make, make sure that we're reading the word of God, letting Christ rule each of us in our relationships, Submitting to one another for the common good, not allowing our emotions to cause conflict between us, not spending time assuming or presuming that we know what the other person thinks or how they feel. You ever find yourself doing that? You're in a conflict with someone and you're, you're thinking about it when they're not around and every thought that crosses your mind about that person is negative. You're assuming the worst intentions. You're just like expecting them to say something stupid the next time you see them. You have bitterness in your heart. This is stinking thinking. This is not godly thinking. This is not thinking that's grounded in the Lord. It's negative thinking. Now, I do want to just pause for a moment and acknowledge the fact that sometimes in relationships, there's conflict because there's actual sin. Not here, but there's actual sin between Christians that may cause conflict. There may be abuse. There may be hateful words uttered. There may be seething bitterness. You could have stolen from someone. There could be some sort of criminal activity between two people. Not here, but sometimes that happens. And the way to deal with that is to exercise church discipline. If you're interested in studying further what church discipline is all about, you really need to familiarize yourself with two critical passages in the word of God. The one is Matthew chapter 18, and there's essentially three steps. If a brother sins against you, you go to that person and you confront him for his fault. And if you win him over, great, everything's restored. But if that brother says, no, I'm gonna continue in sin, you bring another Christian, two witnesses, just like in the 10 commandments. You bring two witnesses and you plead with that person to, to make it right. And if they progress in sin, then you go to the next step. If they repent, it's over and done with. It's under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if they refuse to admit their sin, repent of their sins, then you take it to the church. You go to the church leaders and the church leaders or a delegation of brothers and sisters from the church go and confront this person. And if they say, you're right. I know we've been approached a couple times. We were bullheaded, but now we get it we repent, then you won the person over. But if they continue to sin, then the Bible says you turn them over to Satan, let them buffet their body. Their body. In other words, you excommunicate them from the Christian church. This isn't something from medieval Christianity. This is straight from the pages of scripture. You say to the person, look, you are no longer welcome to fellowship here. And the reason why you're no longer welcome to fellowship here is not because we're trying to be hateful or vengeful or posture ourselves as perfect, but because we want to reflect to you the same kind of broken fellowship that you currently have with the Lord. It also serves to warn the rest of the church. You can read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, where Paul had to, one and following, where Paul had to confront the Corinthian church for allowing heinous sin, heinous sexual misconduct in the church. And it was infecting the whole church like a disease. So if there's true sin between you and another brother, you witness a transgression in another Christian's life, again, you confront, you bring two witnesses, ultimately it leads to disfellowship. At any point in time after the person has been excommunicated, if they repent, you welcome them back with open arms. We're in the restoration business, not the revenge business. We're, we're always open to people being restored to fellowship with the Lord. But at the same time, 
We can't take the mindset, well, live and let live. Live and let live. Now that destroys Christian churches. Unfortunately, across our land, very few churches are prepared to exercise church discipline on people. And this is why so often sin starts to take root in Christian churches. And, and after a generation or two, they're no longer a Christian church. But in this particular case, in this particular case, it was a relational dispute that Paul was begging them to deal with. And the solution is the more they could think like Christ, the greater unity they could enjoy. So let's work hard as a Christian church at being like-minded. Secondly, we're called to be clear-minded, to be reasonable in the way that we think about the issues of life. Let's look at verses four to seven. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. So how often? All the time. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand, meaning that we, we believe that Jesus Christ could come back at any time. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter four, verse seven is probably, I would say in the top 20 most famous verses in scriptures, in, in the scriptures. This section begins with a summons from God to the church to rejoice and to pray. Rejoicing is commanded twice. So that means we got to pay attention. What does it mean to rejoice? Well, rejoicing, this is really critical for us to understand. Rejoicing is not dependent upon our earthly circumstances, but upon our divine circumstances, our eternal circumstances, our fellowship with God, our relationship with Christ, our standing as sons and daughters of the King. And when we understand that, that rejoicing is not dependent on our earthly circumstances, but upon God, God's promises, God's word, God's plan of salvation, then it gives us a different outlook, a different stance on life. And this is what's wonderful about being a Christian. We've, we've see this, we see this all the time in mature Christians where it's like they're, they're in the middle of, of a battlefield and they're being attacked from all sides. Yeah, they're responding to the attacks, but they're not, they're not rattled. They, they stand firm. They still are able to raise their hands in worship. They continue to pray without accusing God of being evil. They keep serving. They keep looking ahead to what God has in store for those that love him. Why? Because they're not rejoicing in money or their career or the applause of men. They're rejoicing in the Lord. Is this not a relevant lesson for all of us right now? Super relevant. And we need to be reminded of this all the time because in our flesh, in our carnality, we're, we're apt to become discouraged and depressed and in a state of perpetual despair because we look around us and we're like, what on earth is happening to the earth? The world's falling apart. We're called to rejoice in the Lord. And again, how often are we called to rejoice? Always. Not just when things are good, but always. And folks, we always have something to rejoice about when we're in the Lord. In your prayer life, when we were kids, we were told, you know, there's four aspects to prayer. A-C-T-S. You need to adore God, confess your sins, thank him for his goodness, and then you offer your supplications, which are your requests. So we have A-C-T-S. Well, when it comes to the T, the thanksgiving part, that should be a really long, meaningful part of your prayer life because if you think about it long enough, we have all kinds of things to be thankful for. All kinds of things to be thankful for. And the more you recite in your mind 
all the things you have to be thankful for, the more fuel you have to increase your joy. We're called to be reasonable. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Make it obvious. Should be part of your testimony. When people think of you, oh, that's a reasonable woman. That's a reasonable man. Reasonableness isn't just your ability to reason through things. Biblically. Reasonableness is a a mind, heart, character word. It's holistic. It collects together the notions of gentleness and equity and long suffering. And And it takes root in your life and it's fertilized, if you will. It grows by the belief that the Lord is at hand. He is with us and he's coming back for us. He's our ever-present help in time of need. Is he not? Isn't it a fascinating thing that we're actually filled with the spirit of God? I've often thought about that. You become aware of how small you are in this world and how feeble you are and how weak you are and how temporary your body is. And then you kind of read all these wonderful scriptures about how great and grand God is. And then the scriptures tell us that we're indwelt by the spirit of God. It's a fascinating thought that the God of the universe would indwell little fleshly bodies like ours. But it's true. He's at hand. He's in us. He manifests his presence when God's people gather and he's at hand in the sense that he's, he's coming back at any moment. And it's this mindset <clears throat> that helps to diffuse bickering between Christians, but it also enables us to avoid anxiety and replace it with prayerfulness. Did you see that in verse six? How many of you at times struggle with anxiety? Don't we all do a little bit? A lot of things in life that, make us anxious. What what are the things that make you anxious? You know, being disgusted by foolishness is a good thing. Being repulsed by evil is a righteous thing. Being upset when other people are hurt or abused is righteous. Blasphemy should bother you. But if we are anxious as Christians, it's actually symptomatic of sin. Why? We're told not to be anxious. So if we are anxious, therefore we violated God's word, it's symptomatic of sin. Why, why is it? What, what, what is the sin behind anxiety? Well, it could be one of at least two things. One could be a God complex. I got to control life. I got I to control the outcomes. You know, if I just run these plays, this is what I should naturally get, Right? That's what I've been told. It's worked for me in the past. And it doesn't happen when we get anxious. So it could be that if if we have the sin of anxiety in our lives, that it's because we have a God complex. We think too highly of our ability to control life and the outcomes of our decisions. Or secondly, it might be symptomatic of idolatry where we have replaced God, trust in God, who alone is worthy of ultimate and lasting trust with trust in our jobs, trust in our pastor, trust in our spouse, trust in our government, trust in our educators, trust in our courts, trust in our physicians. We idolize them. We just assume they're going to do right. And when they don't do right, our lives just collapse around us. We're like, why do I feel so upset right now that the world is falling apart? Maybe it's because I've worshipped it for far too long. Maybe it's because I put trust in something I should never put my trust in in the first place. It's subtle, folks. But I think these these sins are 
are always right there just sort of tempting us. And they, they may even at times be allowed in. And we're anxious because we're trying to control things that are beyond our capabilities or we're trusting in things that are not worthy of our, our faith and trust. And when those things of life prove themselves to be incompetent and inadequate, instead of driving us to a state of anxiety, it should remind us of our need to trust in the Lord, to trust in the Lord. And no matter what happens in this life, God is still God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His promises never change. He hasn't broken one promise yet. He has a perfect track record. His word always comes true. He's never misprophesied. Now you might be thinking to yourself, you know what? I, I think I remember a couple chapters ago, Paul telling us that he was anxious. Hmm. So back in chapter two, verse 28, Paul actually says this. He says, I'm eager to send, and he's talking about sending Epaphroditus, remember him? He wanted to send Epaphroditus to the church. He says, I'm eager to send Epaphroditus that I may be less anxious. We're like, aha, Paul is committing the sin that he's chastising the church against. Well, no, because there's two different Greek words that can be translated as anxiety, and they're different in chapter two and chapter four. They mean different things. So the, in chapter two, verse 28, this particular word means to be free from pain. So he's anxious in the sense that he's anticipating that he will be free from pain. That's the kind of anxiety, you know, it's like have at it. Like I'm, 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 I'm anxious, meaning I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the husband at the, at the altar and I'm waiting for my bride to come through the doors. I'm about to get married. I'm anxious, like I'm excited. Or, I, you know, I, I, got, I got this back pain and the doctor says he can fix it. And I'm looking forward to the day when it will be fixed. That's a, a good kind of anxiety, if you will. It essentially means anticipation. That's fine. You can anticipate and look forward to the future. But the word anxiety in chapter four means a troubling, a fearful kind of anxiousness. And folks, let's not make the mistake of allowing the troubles of the world to whip us up into a worrisome state, into a frenzy of emotions. We all know that when we get there, it doesn't even feel good. It accomplishes nothing. So let's, let's, let's keep, keep the lid on it. Let's make sure we're, we're just taking a, a regular check of our, our, our thinking and our, and, our, and our emotions and that we're trusting in the Lord and we're not allowing our cages to get too rattled by the circumstances of life. One day they will pass or you will pass. But either way, God will make all things new. And here we have this beautiful teaching that when we set aside our anxiety, God's peace, a peace that surpasses human understanding, that surpasses our ability to conjure up in and of ourselves, helps us to make sense out of life and it guards our hearts and it guards our minds. It guards the way we feel and it guards the way that we think. This is what it means to be clear-minded, to trust in the Lord. The secret to clear-mindedness fundamentally is to trust in the Lord and not allow yourself to get all whipped up in a frenzy of emotion. I'm seeing this. And many folks in the Christian church, th those that tend to be the most sensitive to righteousness, most concerned about what's happening in the world. Hey, we need, to, we need to combat the lies with truth. I've said it many times. We got here by lies. We get out with truth. So we're going to keep preaching truth into culture. We're going to keep combating the lies. We're going to speak out against injustice. But we're not going to allow ourselves to get whipped up into a frenzy of anxiety and stress so that we're despairing of life itself. If we do that, then we are either guilty of a God complex or idolizing the world around us. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna steady ourselves in the Lord 
We're going to be reasonable, look at the text, to the point that it's obvious to everybody. And by the way, that's an attractive thing. Because your godless pagan friends are going to look at that and say, I want some of that too. And conversations are going to be had. And then finally, we want to be holy minded Finally, brothers, the scriptures tell us whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Are you thinking about these things? What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the peace, the God of peace will be with you. Again, the Christian faith is an imitative faith and Paul is never shy to say, look, when Christ has wrought a victory in my life, it might be a good idea for you to follow my lead. He's not shy in saying that. He's not taking credit for it. He understands it's the work of God. But he wants people to see this stuff in action. And I think Paul had a pretty big uh, pulpit when he was able to write this from a prison cell. He's writing about joy and prayer and not being anxious while he's in prison. So this isn't a theoretical sermon. It wasn't just some guy that just stumbled out of seminary with all this knowledge but no life experience. He was living it. He was living it. When you see these things present in my life, he says, practice it too. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, he goes on to to give us this wonderful list and it's all predicated on this idea that thinking is foundational to Christian growth. You know that, right? Like I, I think emotions are a beautiful thing and we should have a deep abiding emotional relationship with God. And I'm all into hands-on service. We need to do things for God. But are we working on this? Developing our minds. Thinking about the things that God wants us to think about. Everyone is going to be thinking about something. Minds aren't blank. The question is, what are you thinking about during the week? Well, we're told of the kind of things that we should be thinking about. If we don't think about these things, the mind can lead the whole person into all kinds of danger. So we're to think true thoughts, whatever is true. What are some true thoughts? Well, it includes thoughts that are honorable, the text tells us. This, by the way, is also used of church leaders. Church leaders are to be honorable, not perfect, but they're to be honorable. We're to think about that which is just, which is another word for right. So that which is true. We are to think about that which is pure. We're to consider God's commands in the area of moral purity, especially in the sexual dimension. We've got a lot of people that are sex addicts in our culture today that struggle with lust and it always starts up here. They're thinking dirty thoughts. They're filling their minds with filth. And then they're like, why is it that I always struggle with sexual sin? You got to purify your mind. Think about pure things, righteous things. This doesn't mean that you never think about sex because God actually invented it. But you think about it biblically. You think about it in the right context. So we need to be pure-minded. He says we're to think about that which is lovely, meaning pleasing or amiable, not just something that's pleasurable to our flesh, but truly lovely and pure and righteous in the eyes of God. And then sort of this catch-all phrase, anything that's worthy of praise, meaning that which is attractive or praiseworthy, we're to think about these things. Not think dirty thoughts, not think depressed thoughts, not think hedonistic thoughts, atheistic thoughts. We're to think about righteous things. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, if there is anything worthy of praise, it says in the middle of verse eight there, think about these things. By the way, this if clause, if there is, 
encourages us to think beyond this list because it's just a short list, it's just a summary. It's not, it doesn't capture everything. To think about anything that's excellent or praiseworthy. We, t- we are to center our minds on these qualities. And when we center our minds on these qualities, discernment and wisdom grows. How does a person become wise? Have you thought much about that? How does a person become wise? Reading books? Well, might help. But wisdom really is the proper application of knowledge, right? So you have to have knowledge. It means you need to be in this book. You grow in knowledge. But then you meet people that know a lot about the Bible, but their lives are always a disaster. So wisdom is where you take what you know and you skillfully apply it. And skillful application of God's word comes about when we observe other people that are wise, that put it into practice. You know, we, we, we spend time with godly people. We observe how they take what we, all, we both know and put it into practice. But wisdom also grows through meditation. Thinking about the things of God, piecing it together. Biblical meditation, by the way, is always filling of the mind. Eastern meditation is an emptying of your mind. That's evil, that's wicked. The Bible never tells us to empty our minds tells us to fill our minds. We fill our minds with truth. We think about it. We're making the connections. We're considering how to respond to life circumstances. When we mess up, we analyze and assess what we did wrong. We plot a new course for the future. Our minds should be on thinking mode all the time. Maybe except when we're sleeping. We should always be thinking about life through a godly from a godly perspective. We center our minds in these qualities and we grow in discernment. Now, in contrast to this, if I were to take you over to Romans chapter one, wow. (laughs) Romans chapter one really is an expose of human sinfulness. There's a lot of nasty stuff that's mentioned in Romans chapter one. It's kind of just from verse 16 in particular, it's going through a whole list of sinful activities that people have committed. And several times, if you read through Romans 1, God puts his finger on the cause of human sinfulness. He's talking about lesbianism here. He's talking about idolatry. He's talking about murder, maliciousness, strife, gossip, all kinds of human sins. Like, why? Why is this happening? Well, let me just touch down in a couple of spots here. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. They became futile in their thinking. And then in verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Instead of filling their minds with truth, they filled their minds with with lies. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, he gave them up to a debased mind. You know why the world is so nutty? Because people are not focusing on that which is just, that which is lovely, that which is commendable, that which is pure. And so when people involve themselves in sin, oh, they might find themselves chemically addicted to a particular substance or flat broke because they don't handle their money God's way or having behind them a series of divorces and broken relationships or whatever, they might even find themselves dead. But if you boil it all down to the root issue, it's because God, they, 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 they denied God's truth. They allowed lies to take up residence in their lives. And having suppressed the truth of God, God sort of doubly damns them by saying, okay, you don't want to think about the things I want you to think about? I'm going to permit you to absolutely lose your mind. 
And this is what's happened in, in the West. This is the only explanation. This is the only way we can explain the fact that in our generation, people have more education than humans have ever had at any point in human history from the beginning till now. And they're stupider and stupider and stupider by the day. How's that possible? Because they're not thinking God's thoughts. They're just trying to sort it out by themselves. God's like, okay, you want to reject my law? You want to concoct your own laws? You think you, you want to decide what's right and wrong? Even to the point that you're taking righteousness and calling it evil and evil and calling it, you want to do that? Okay, I'm, I'm just going to turn you over to the futility of your own thinking. And folks, because this is the case, what we can anticipate and expect is that it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And sadly, godless people, they, 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 they see what we see as well, but they, they think it's fine. They think it's fine. Oh, it's, it's, it's okay to uh, murder babies. They've actually convinced themselves that's okay to murder babies. It's okay to pick your gender, but at the same time, we're all into science, biology, but you can pick your gender. It's all, it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. But this is the trajectory of the world. Well, we want to be different in all of that. Instead of participating in the nuttiness or thinking like they think, you don't have to have a high IQ to be a successful Christian. You don't have to master Western logical syllogisms or no Western logical fallacies to make it through life. You need to get yourself primarily into the word of God. Think about that which is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, anything else that happens to be excellent anything else that happens to be worthy of praise, and you will actually outshine the smartest people around you because your thoughts will be more reflective of God's thoughts. So let's pursue like-mindedness. Let's not allow conflict to get in the way of our mission to honor and glorify God. Let's be clear-minded and let's be holy-minded and let's make sure all of that is grounded and founded not in ourselves, our own efforts, our own moral systems, but in the Lord for his honor and glory and for our benefit.